Hello, um, welcome to chapter two of the Harris 9th edition textbook. And we're just gonna get started. So in two one, they basically describe some of the things that you should do during the lab. So the most important rule is to know and assess the hazard, avoid what you or instructor is deemed to be dangerous. Before you're working, you know, you need to know the ins and outs of your lab. You need to wear your lab coat and preferably flame resistant because sometimes you're going to encounter experiments that have, that involves the use of flame and stuff. You need to wear lab safety glasses with side shields. Never ever um, use contact lens because there are gonna be chemicals that interfere with your contact lens and that's not gonna be good for your eyes. Use gloves when pouring acid or dangerous chemicals. During the experiment, concentrated organic acid should be done in a fume hood. Don't emit bigger fumes. That's going to be bad for your health and the health of your other lab mates. Clean up spills. And spills on your skin must be treated with water. You need to know how to operate the emergency shower and eye washes in case of emergency. And you need to always labor, label the containers. That way um, you can backtrack what chemical is which. Some things that you need to know in the lab notebook is you need to state what was done. You need to state what was observed and be understandable to someone and make sure that they can follow along. So in state what was done, you put, you put the objective of that experiment, state what was observed. So while you're doing the experiment, gather the data that you see during the experiment. Maybe it's quantitative, maybe it's qualitative, something that you can describe on numbers, right? That's quantitative and also qualitative, meaning you can kind of describe it based on color, based, based on physical appearance. And during this um, part, you need to make some sort of graph, right? And number three, when you're doing this, make sure that, you know, you try to avoid a lot of very hard jargon. So that way everyone can follow along because that's the most important thing in your lab notebooks. And be honest, right? If you made a mistake, just be honest. Two, three talks about balance. Um, in electronic balance, it uses electromagnetic force to balance load on pan. The readability and balance is smallest increment of mass that is shown in the balance. When you are using the balance, make sure to place a clean vessel, which is the container, on the balance pan. You need to tear it by placing the empty clean vessel and pressing a button to reset it to zero. Then add whatever you want to put. If you want to prevent corrosion, never ever put chemical on the actual weighing pan. Then mechanical balance is used to equalize the mass on both sides of the pan. So that's like your typical middle school and high school balance pans, which you know, you're trying to figure out whether they're equal or not. If it's not, you need to put more mass or um, take out some mass and so on and so forth. So we're going to discuss briefly about buoyancy. Buoyancy is just the upward force done on an object in a liquid or gaseous substance. In this part of the textbook, they discuss buoyancy equation. And buoyancy equation is shown here is m that's your um that's the boys equation m with a um carrot is one minus da da is the density of air shown here let me put my laser pointer so da is your density of air it's 0 0.012 grams per milliliter near one bar and 25 degrees celsius that's your standard temperature and pressure and your DW in here is the density of the calibration weight, which is 8.0 grams per milliliter. Notice the similarity of the unit in here. This is very important when you're doing this kind of 
math. And D is the density of the object being weight. So density in here needs to be, guess what, in grams per milliliter. So here's the first question. A pure compound called TRIS is used a primary standard to measure concentration of acid. The volume of acid that reacts with known mass of TRIS tells us the concentration of the acid. Find the true mass of TRIS with a density of this number if the apparent mass weight in air is 100 grams. So set it up what you're given, right? So TRIS in here is going to be your known compound. So this is not going to be the DA, obviously, because it's not air, nor it's going to be water. So we know that this is going to be your D. So this is your D right here, right? So that's your density. And then the apparent mass, which is your M, is this 100 grams, right? So this is your M. And all you need to know in here is you're given. So what I would do when you're doing kind of problem, always write your given. So you have a given. And in there, you're going to put what you know. So D would be this one right here. All right. Let me just put it like that. And then your mass, which is your 100 grams I don't know why I can do that make sure to write the units that helps you and your teacher when they're looking at your calculations and also DA DA is given to us it's this point um, zero zero one two grams per milliliter and DW is also given which is this 8 grams per milliliter so let me put it here okay so now that we have our given we can solve the equation so we're just plugging in we already know that the M is 100, so we just inserted 100 on M. 1 minus 0 0.012, that's your DA, that's given also. And 8.0 is given right there. Then 1 minus 0 0.012, once again, that's your density of air. Then 1.3 grams per milliliter is your density. So typically, in this problem, they should always have the density of air given to you density of water being given to you and in this problem you're always going to have the mass right and the density of the substance so just take a note so in here you're always going to have the mass and density of your substance okay say sub okay so just erase that let's move on burette so burette um it's a glass tube with increments allowing to measure volume of liquid using the valve at the bottom so this valve right here is also known as a stopcock now unlike typical forms of um volume equipments that you use right for chemistry where zero is typically at the bottom this one is a bit bizarre because zero is on top as shown right here so that's zero supposedly and to measure the volume that is being delivered you need to measure the final level minus the initial level so the final level in here what i mean by that is that after you dump out the liquid that is in the burette, that's gonna be your final level. So this is the volume being dumped. So this is after being dumped, right? After being dumped.
well initial level is what you started hence the whoop, um, name initial level and then that tells you the volume being delivered if the eye is too high it can result to parallax so parallax is happens when there's a difference of the height whether your place that you're working in is too small for your eyes to see or is it too high so when you're operating a burette make sure to wash the burette with a new solution it depends each and every single time you need to make sure that the air bubble is eliminated before you use it make sure to drain the liquid slowly make sure to deliver this is very important make sure to deliver a fraction of a drop near the endpoint because endpoint as you're going to learn in titration is when important changes are going to take place and also i think in general you should develop a habit of delivering just tiny bits you know not just right away because you're going to miss the end point and that's the one thing that you should never miss when you're doing especially titration and when you're reading the bottom of the concave of the meniscus this is important when you're reading this you always read right here at this level right here you don't ever read this part right here okay don't ever read that always read the one that says here which is reason and estimate the reading to one tenth of a division you need to avoid parallax which I already talked about and account for graduation thickness and readings so in a, in a titration increments of reagent in the burette are added to analyte analyte is what's the volume or what's the liquid in that burette so analyte is liquid in that period, in this case, until reaction is being completed. From the volume being delivered, we can calculate the quantity of the analyte. Another um, glassware that is being used to for volume is volumetric glass. It has a particular volume of a solution at 208 degrees Celsius when the bottom of the disc is adjusted to the center of the mark on the neck of the flask. In here, it always has a TC and a TD. So TC tells you the temperature. In this case, it's quite pretty small, but it says here 20 degrees Celsius. It tells you also the TD, which is the volume. As you can see here, it's, let me erase it. It's 500 milliliters. That one is more apparent. To use a volumetric flask, you need to dissolve the desired mass of reagent in the flask by swirling with less than the final volume of the liquid. Then add more liquid and swirl the solution again. Then adjust the final volume with as much well-mixed liquid in the flask as possible. And some of the vocabulary that you should know is that adsorption, adsorption is the process in which a substance sticks to a surface absorption is the process in which a substance is taken inside the substance like you're absorbing something like a sponge that's the way I remember between adsorption and absorption absorption absorb like a sponge adsorption sticks to a surface pipettes and syringe so how to use a pipette so you need to do three things aspirate dispense and to eject the tip of that pipette so the first one is to plush the plunger into the first stop then you need to lower the tip below the level of solution then you slowly release the plunger and then watch solution enter and then make sure that there's no air in there when it comes to dispensing place pipette tip into the tube excuse me touch tip to side near button and then plush plunger down to first then second stop do not re-aspirate the liquid it's going to give you um, inaccurate volume and inaccurate results as a result of that eject the tip and 
What that means is to reuse if dispensing the same reagent into separate tubes, and when it doubt, you need to draw it out. And syringe. Syringe is just an instrument that is used for very minuscule um, volumes. In fact, here, microliters syringe comes into one to 500 microliters, the U thingy here, that means micro, and have an accuracy and precision close to 1%. So when you're using a syringe, take up and discard several volumes of liquid to wash the glass walls and to remove air bubbles from the barrel. The steel, the steel needle is attacked by strong acid and will contaminate strongly acidic solutions with iron. A syringe is more reliable than a micropipette, which is the one here, but the syringe requires more care and handling, and that's just the nature of it. And then process of filtration and desicc um, desiccator. So in here, um, the process of it begins with an impurity solid. When you add a hot solvent in there, right, and when it's heated and eventually dissolve, you're going to have two parts instead of just one part right here. And that's going to have now your soluble impurity and the desired compound. Now your desired compound is insoluble. And after that, after it's being heated, it's gonna be cooled and crystal, or what is known as a crystallized. And then after that, it's going to be suction filtered and you're going to get the desired compound into this funnel right there. Now, some vocabulary that you should know. Liquid from which a substance precipitates or crystallizes is called a mother liquor. Liquid that pa passes through the filter is called a filtrate. Slurry, slurry suspension of solid in a liquid. And then this entire process of filtration is what is known as gravimetric analysis, which is to determine the unknown substance. Typically, this is done in organic chemistry. And usually what you're gonna do with that unknown is that you're going to run some tests like check its melting point, probably do some TLC, thin layer chromatography to figure out what substance it is because there's plenty of substance and you're just trying to figure it out the unknown by running some tests and then i just put the desiccator in here because i can't really put it on anywhere else from this powerpoint but desiccator is just used for heating stuff and then we're going to end by talking about correction for thermal expansion so this is one of the form of math that you need to know in this chapter. So for the correction for thermal expansion, C prime and D prime are the concentration. So C prime and D prime in here are gonna be the concentration and density that is being given to us at a certain temperature. Well, C and D is gonna be applied at a temperature T. So here's the question. A 0.03146 milliliters aqueous solution was prepared in winter when the lab temperature was at 178 degrees Celsius. What is the molarity of solution on a warm day when the temperature is to 58 degrees Celsius? So what you're gonna do is know your given. So your given in here is that this is right here, your so this 0 0.03146 goes along with this, right? And then the molarity of the solution on a warm day when the temperature is 258 degrees Celsius is different, right? So just remember that. See at 25, right? You don't know that. The 0 0.099075 is typically what's going to be given within that certain temperature, and then this 0 0.03146 milliliter, uh, 46 molarity is gonna be on the other concentration with its given density right here. So 
at a 25 degrees Celsius, you're given this. On this one, it's going to be given right at that 0 0.3146 polarity. And that's about it.